Hey everyone, what is going on? Welcome back to another video here on the RC Explained channel. In this week's video, we're gonna be talking about the Arma Limitless build that we have started. We're gonna go through it as an update video to see exactly where we stand today and what is remaining left here in the build. Now I'm gonna go through a couple points before we get to taking a look at that limitless vehicle. The first thing that I wanna do is give you sort of a summary or a view as to exactly how we arrived at where we are today. And then what I wanna do, and I believe this is very important for those of you who want to get into this sort of type of build, whether it is the limitless or any other vehicle requiring you to select a power system. And lastly, I'll show you exactly where all those components now live today and we'll talk about something that I am concerned about with the build and we'll see the potential solution that I have and whether that seems like it will work or not. So let's get started and talk about the history of this build. I purchased an Arma Limitless and said that the subscribers of this channel is going to select the power system, the battery, speed control, and motor that essentially go into this build. All you guys knew at that point is it was going to be a 100 mile per hour build. And that is very important because 100 miles per hour today does not look the same as it was, let's say, in the year of 2010. It's a lot different as as to how and how easily we can actually achieve a 100 mile per hour build. However, even with this being said, the motor and power system that got selected was one that can deliver a tremendous amount of power, making it a very interesting type of build for a 100 mile per hour goal. And that is to use the Castle XLX2 electronic speed control along with the Castle 1721 2400 kV motor. Now, if you have not seen the video, as to why this motor is unbelievably special, I would highly recommend going and taking a look in the description for a link that will get you to that video. Now moving into the next part of the video, this is very important for those of you that are looking to build your own radio control car where you have to select the speed control, battery pack, and motor that you're going to install into your vehicle. Now this is very important because we want to have the most potential success as possible as well as a reliable power system. Now I had to go back through a few comments on one of the videos, I can't remember exactly which one it was, and a lot of comments were saying saying that this is essentially so easy. Take the world's most powerful radio controlled motor, drop it into one of the most highly potential in terms of speed radio control vehicle and it's going to easily get you well over 100 miles per hour. Well this is exactly what the goal is not. We don't want to just take a motor, not have any consideration for any part of the build and expect to hit whatever speed that that setup is essentially geared for. Now the reason why this is important is because generally speaking you may not know the potential of the motor and the power system and the vehicle as a combination and what it can possibly hit in terms of speed. And because of this, you want to kind of look at this in a stepped process where you first hit an 80 mile per hour target, then you move up to 90 miles per hour, then you move up to 100 miles per hour. And along this path, you are checking the temperatures of all your components and making certain that everything is okay. It would not be ideal if you take your motor that you got and you had this 100 mile per hour target, but what you're going to do is gear it with whatever stock gearing it came with. You didn't realize that it actually was geared for 130 miles per hour, you run it and you have a significant potential for damage components, meaning not that successful and not that reliable. This is the last thing that I want you guys to do is to get into this type of situation where you have all kinds of things burning out. Believe me when I say that I get a lot of emails talking about this exact thing where motors and speed controls are burning out and we don't understand the reason. This, what we're going through right now is the exact reason. We need to have confidence that the motor can hit a certain speed, but we don't want to just go and force it to hit that particular speed. We want to do things in a stepped approach. Now in our case, we know that the motor very confidently can easily get us 150 miles per hour. So hitting 100 miles per hour is not going to be that much of a big deal for our power system. However, what will be a big deal is we're not looking to just grab our brushless motor, throw it in 
in there, pay no regard to anything else, and hope that we hit 100 miles per hour, pull the trigger, and we see 140 on the radar gun. That is exactly what we don't want to do. We want to target this for 100 miles per hour, and we're not looking to exceed that because we're trying to prove that we're actually selecting our power system very methodically in order to hit the target that we're going for. That is key. So now let's take a look at our Limitless and dive right into exactly what's been done thus far. Here is our Limitless build. Now, the first thing I'm gonna bring your attention to is the Castle XLX2, and this is the electronic speed control that is going to power our radio control vehicle. The first thing about this speed control is its position. Now, in order to get the position correct, what I wanted to do is give myself a drill jig. This located the fasteners that I would use to securely mount the speed control. Not only that, but it served the purpose as being a standoff plate just to get the speed control up a couple millimeters. And the reason for that is because around this corner here, you can see that the chassis plate actually comes up, and if I didn't have that standoff bracket, the corner of the speed control would interfere with this chassis plate as it does increase in height in that corner. Now, another thing I had to do to make sure this works is grind out a bit of plastic so I can bury this electronic speed control right into the corner to maximize my clearance because I have a fairly large gear being used here. And we'll talk shortly here about the gear that we're using and why, but the main point that I'm trying to make here is that we got the speed control in such a way where we have about an eighth of an inch clearance, which is about three millimeters. That should be plenty enough space to make certain that we do not have any type of interference. This speed control is not going to go anywhere. And if I go and show you, we'll rotate the car up here and we take a look, you can see that the fasteners we used here are the four in this area right here. It looks like those were meant to be there. So I wanted to make sure utilizing that plastic spacer plate they can see through the hole there that is unused. I wanted to make sure that those have the correct holes and I can use it as a drill jig to get the screw centers and position perfect the first time and not have to re-drill anywhere. So that worked very well. Now there's a few wires here that I have the first one being the one that I have not yet decided what I'm going to do. I thought maybe I'll make a bracket and I can 3D print something that will allow me to have the switch here mounted to our center brace. That is one option. In many cases on these speed controls what I do is I actually cut the wire, I solder it so it's permanently acting as always on. I never really use switches. I'm not a fan of switching my radio control vehicles on and off. If you have any suggestions as to what you would typically do with one of these, let me know in the comment section below. My personal preference is to either fasten it here or to just cut, solder it so that this is permanently on. So the other couple wires that exit out from the speed control, they go directly to the motor. We have our sensor wire that goes to the back side of our brushless motor and we have our big heavy duty eight gauge leads that go from the back of the speed control to the back top side of our motor. Now if we rotate around we can see the beast of a motor which is otherwise known as the Castle 1721 2400 kV motor. So now taking a look at the gearing here we can see that the gearing is not anywhere close to one to one. A lot of guys are running very close to one to one gear ratio. However, if we use the stock gearing that came with the Limitless or even gearing that would give us a one to one or thereabouts ratio, that would be very misleading towards our goal of 100 miles per hour. We would probably end up with in excess of 140, 150 miles per hour and that is exactly what we are not trying to do. We we want to target this for 100 miles per hour by carefully selecting the gears in order to get us there. And that's why we have the ratio that we're looking at where we had to increase the size of that spur gear, which then led us into interference issues with the original position that I wanted to use for the speed control. And this is one of the reasons why we've had the delay on this 
build because that spur gear took just about forever to actually bring in. I actually brought one in and it was not what I was looking for and had to go through the process yet again. Now moving a little bit over here, this is the location that you would typically put a stock ESC, the XLX2 is so massive, there's no chance of it even remotely fitting in here in any way, shape, or form. So this will remain in stock configuration. Again, I tried to limit the amount that I would modify this build. The only thing I did was drill in the holes that you saw to mount that speed control using that white speed control offset plate. The other thing here, I don't know exactly what uh, receiver I'm using, but this is probably very insignificant to the build. You use typically whatever you have, whatever you need, and there is a four channel, but I'm probably only going to be using a two channel receiver. Now as for the servo that I use, I decided to use this high-tech D645MW. This is a digital high voltage, high torque servo. I use some very similar servos in a turbine jet and they work very well and I've never had issues with this style servo. So this is the one that I'm using for this build. It's not super quick nor do I need it to be very quick. And the last thing I wanted to bring to your attention is this custom bracket that allows us to secure a trim piece that actually follows along the side of the metal chassis plate. I wanted to be able to connect that to the metal chassis plate. And some guys, what they do is they use their factory battery box or battery bay holder here and utilize this section so that they can actually mount that trim piece to this but they do have to cut away a lot of this area in order to get it to fit around this motor. I did not want to cut the plastic piece just in case we decide to do something in the future and revert this back to a stock configuration, allowing me to use this battery bay in this area. So I have this plastic trim piece, which holds that trim piece, and i show you exactly how it does that on the other side here. Here you can see three screws holding this plastic trim piece. These go directly into that white 3D printed bracket. And then the three screws that go directly into the metal chassis plate. And all six of those screws you can see are on that piece. And that's exactly what hold that trim piece in the correct location. Now what I was thinking is to take this custom bracket that I've created and throw the actual CAD file on the Patreon website so that you may download that as well as this one if you would like to use them in your limitless build. Now this is the standoff bracket that is also known as the drill jig that allowed me to drill the correct position for the holes needed to mount this XLX2. So if you're interested in that, I haven't done that yet, but when I do, if I do, I will leave a link in the description below for these two components. Now the last part that I want to go over, and this is what does concern me somewhat, this is the rear drive shaft that connects that front or center spur gear to the rear differential here located at the back of the vehicle. Now this center shaft, if I do push it towards the front and rear, you can see the amount of play that is actually in this shaft. Now this is a significant amount of play and I understand that in mechanical systems you do want tolerance and slack so that it prevents binding and nothing is going to stress itself. However, this here is a little excessive and it does concern me because it gets somewhat close to the very end of the pocket with this drive dog coupler. So what I am looking for is a solution. If you guys have anything as to what you've done here, something simple that can fix this, what I plan to do is to put a spring on this side, which would then push this shaft all the way to the other side of the range. And then if I put the same spring in this side, it should hold it approximately center and allow this to be in a position that is a little more accessible acceptable in the way that I see this. Let me know what you think. Is this a concern? What have you done? And would this solution be sufficient for you? Well guys, I'm hoping to get the Limitless out there on the road. I have to now find a new spot to run the Limitless because the one that I selected, oddly enough, the area has now been built up so quickly that it is now too busy to actually operate on the street that I was once considering. So I'm trying to figure out where else I can run it in the Southern Ontario area. I'm sure there's somewhere, have not found it yet, but as soon as I do, I'm going to have it on that roadway. As always, 
like the video if you do. Don't forget to hit that sub button so that I can see you in that next video. Thanks a lot for watching. See you in the next one.